So, ladies and gentlemen, those that lie betwixt, we're going to talk about only cans first date, or how we used a game about erotic can photography to tell a story about familial bloodlines, cosmic horror, advertising, and the horrors of capitalism. First slide. So, who am I? I am Sean Oxpring. I am the creative lead on Only Cans First Date. I am a senior designer at Simmer Digital in Sheffield. Next one. This is how advertising works. Advertising appeals to the id. It messes with you. It decides, it goes, you know what? What sells sex? Let's make our food sexy. Let's make you want to fuck a burger. <laughs> Let's make things really unpleasant and, and tap into like the deepest part of the mind. And that was the main sort of like inspiration for a game about taking photos of sexy cans. You'll see in like Coca-Cola adverts, you've got these cans covered in moist droplets and they sparkle and they pour out, they effervesce all over the camera. Uh, especially at the start of like cinema, uh, like cinema sessions and you just go to the toilet and then they like pour liquid in front of you and it's like, oh, you can have a good time in this cinema, aren't you? Next slide. The way that only cans works is it was sort of it was the way we wanted to, the game to work was it was like its own internal marketing uh, software like you might have got in the nineties. So it is basically that you this is how the game starts. You are playing the Shoes Heritage Collection and it welcomes you to the Shoes Heritage the Heritage Collection. Next slide, and you click on the first can, and the can has a description. It has likes and it has dislikes, which is pretty weird for a can, because cans don't have likes and dislikes because they're cans. But that's fine, so you click begin session with this can. Next slide. And you have this gorgeous looking, highly rendered, shiny can floating erotically in front of you. <laughs> and what you do is you snap and you spray. You snap and spray until eventually the can gets so aroused that it explodes. And I didn't mention this, but the can moans every single time that you get it right. <laughs> and then it... The can comes. Anyway, next, next slide. <laughs> and the can's got sexier as time goes by. This is a can with a garter belt on it. That's nice, isn't it? You want to buy that, don't you? <laughs> you want that can. <laughs> it's delicious. You want to lick it. We had a thing called the lick test, um, and the lick test was basically if the can looked it like it was lickable, then it goes in the game. Next slide. Ooh, there's a can with shibari and piercings. That's pretty hot, isn't it? Kanbari, yeah. Oh, there's a can wearing leather. Ooh, interesting. Next slide. Here's a can with arms. <laughs> Sexy arms that could hold you at night. It's also mayonnaise flavoured. More on that later. Next slide. And then at the end of the list of cans, there's like, I don't remember how many cans there were, there was like 30 of them or more? There's so many. Um, you get this one that says, please don't unlock this. More on that story later. Next slide. <laughs> the game did bonkers well. People enjoyed it. We got this community. This is all can art <laughs> made of the cans. We had Cheese Man. We had. I love, this is my favourite one, because I happen to love bees, but like, I've got an actual printout of that on my desk, because I love it so much. Uh, but there, people were making, like, can art, they were, they were applying personas to all of the cans, which is exactly what we wanted, because we described them as people. Next slide. So why the hell was it so popular? The first answer is that one of my friends, Greg, he's the stupendium on uh, YouTube, if you like, like, game raps and nerdcore, then you should check him out. He made a song called Vending Machine of Love for it. I asked him, I was like, hey, do you want to make a song for this sexy can game we're working on? He was like, sure, why not? And he knocked it out in a day. It was amazing. And here is a clip of it, because it's about five minutes long. So this is a small clip of it. You've ruined my presentation. <laughs> So he really wanted it to be really sleazy. Like, he, he, like he, he got the tone immediately. He was like, what a sleazy game. But also, the other thing that made people excited about the game was the incredibly deep lore. Like, we had, like, five 
narrative designers and me on the project, and I'm a massive fan of like al like alternate reality games, which is like little hidden secrets in games. So we filled this thing to the brim, almost like a can, with lore. Um, so I'm going to try and re I'm going to try and explain the story of Only Cans in about like five minutes. So we're going to be going through slides at a mile a minute here. So She's LLC is a company that makes cans of fizzy drink. They're a, they're a normal company. They, they they operate like a normal computer. So like they have capitalism and things like that. They they like growing. They've been making lines of products for years, and that is where we lead on to John Cheese the Third. John Cheese the Third is the current owner. He um, inherited this after his father died performing one of the ten forbidden sex acts. Uh, it was called the Flying Constantine. Uh, and he has a son, John Cheese the Third. No, John Cheese the Fourth. John Cheese the Third uh, is looking forward to retiring and giving the family, uh, like the, the, the family jewels, family crown, the inheritance, the, the factory, over to his son. But unfortunately, his son dies. In a horrible, horrible accident, he is parachuting. He's um, parachuting out of a plane. Uh, the parachute stops working for some reason, and he just splats into the floor. This leads John Shees III to go on a decade-long voyage of mourning. He travels the world. He's trying to like get over the fact that his son has died, and he's just not really handling it very well. And that causes the stock prices of Shees to crash. Which means that a Russian bootleg company called Cheese. This gets really confusing from this point, by the way. <laughs> Cheese is a Russian bootleg company that makes um, bootlegs of Cheese drinks. It's Cheese and Cheese, it's fine. It's fine, you'll get used to it. Um, and they end up buying Cheese and then incorporating the Cheese logo into the Cheese logo so that both of them are Cheese. It's fine, it makes sense when you go through it. And they decide that they're going to make a range of products to um, make Americans happy. So the way they do that is they think, what do Americans like? Ah, oh, well, they like cheese, they like mustard, they like mayonnaise, they like ketchup. Let's make some ketchup-flavored fizzy drinks. And naturally, that tanks the stock. So when John Cheese comes back from his period of mourning, he then buys out cheese again, and it is like a renaissance of sodas. He comes back and he restores the family name. He starts making the best and most delicious drinks again. He's like the Willy Wonka of soda at this point. He's doing lots of really cool stuff. But he still misses his son. And it turns out that in that decade of mourning, he's been doing some pretty weird occult stuff. He's been traveling to Egypt. He's been collecting artifacts. He's been figuring out weird stuff going on in the background. He, he went to Romania to learn about vampires. He's just going around and doing stuff, and it's a bit weird. And the board don't know this, that it's completely below, the, it's, it's, he's operating below the radar at this point. He's been doing sort of weird research projects in the background. In fact, he starts selling off she's factories around the world underneath their noses, and is using that money to fund something called Project S. And as he starts to make Project S, and, he, and it's about to come to fruition, the Cheese board actually cotton on to what he's doing, and they send their private army, because Cheese has a private army at this point, because all big corporations kind of do, and they find him and they shoot him before he can see his dreams come to fruition. And that leads to the final can. Once you complete all the other cans, the screen goes black and then it's re-illuminated in an unpleasant sort of beaming light flickering above you. And you see She's Thirstborn. She's Thirstborn, the long-rated result of Project S. Both human soul and can combine into one perfect organism. It is the first of many. You must be approach it with caution, and there will be consequences. Please reconsider. But people click it anyway, don't they? And you see this thing on the screen. This thing is illuminated towards you. It has a horrible, unblinking eye constantly twitching and looking at you. It looks like it's incredible pain and it goes, Father! Father, where are you? <laughs> it turns out that he has managed to get the soul of his son and put it into a can. He has been doing this under the noses of everyone. His mindless, he has done this thing without caring about anything and he has done this and it's horrible. 
So the game was propelled by that. <laughs> that strong convoluted narrative and being able to put all those cans in order and the that because it just came from all those descriptions. You can work out that story by putting them all in order and figuring it out from that. So the themes of the game were cosmic horror of capitalism for the first one. So I'm going to talk about that for a little bit. Next one. Capitalism is a thing about making things go up. People like the number going up. That's the, that's the main thing from capitalism. You like, when you invest in something, investors constantly want to see more growth. Now, we live on a finite planet. There's no way that, that, that infinite growth can continue, but that is what capitalism is predicated on. And that is, to me, a genuinely horrifying idea because it means that eventually it's going to grow beyond what our planet can handle. And in fact, it already kind of is. But it, it, it feels like it, it's built upon something that doesn't make sense physically. And you see the sort of horrible things that corporations do around the world, especially like, like Nestle and Unilever and stuff. They um, go around doing these horrible, horrible things. Uh, like um, they leak uh, dangerous toxins into the environment. They will buy water tables up from local governments so then they actually own all the water so that people can't actually farm, they can't drink, that kind of thing. Um, they just do really, really nice stuff. There's like um, the cocoa trade, there's a lot of slavery in the cocoa trade, so when you're, when you're eating like chocolates, that kind of thing happens. And the, this doesn't come from any sort of like moustache twirling villain. This comes from the banality of evil that comes from a capitalist uh, society and uh, from a corporation, because corporations want to make money, and the way they make money is by finding the easiest way to suck as much inf like, like value out of everything in the world. And to me, that feels almost exactly like Cthulhu, <laughs> if that makes sense. So you imagine like, the, like Nestle as a big growing thing, and it's constantly going to keep growing, and it's grabbing stuff. It's why, it's why you always see like big companies they eventually find banks because the only way for them to continue growing is by making a bank because then the bank starts bankrolling other companies that could then that company can then leech off of. And that's the only way you can keep getting the stock prices to keep going up because eventually you can't keep doing things. The next bit was about the advertising of parasocial relationships. I don't know if anyone knows about parasocial relationships, but essentially uh, what they are is, it's when you form a one-sided relationship with someone online, specifically, it's used a lot of advertising nowadays because of, um, essentially, YouTubers offer like a sort of, a personal sort of, I know this person even though I don't really, and you have like conversations with them even though you don't, and you end up with these people sort of like, really rooting for people they don't actually know and saying, this person's my friend even though I've never met them but I've, I his, listen to them all the time, and I, I listen to them in podcasts as if I'm really there with them in the room. And what better way to form a parasocial relationship with something than to actually put a human soul in it? <laughs> and that was the sort of the, the driving force of the She's Board after um, they find Project S, they go, oh, well, we've got this horrible twitching flesh can thing. How can we use this technology to actually make some money? And the way that they did that was go, okay, how about we actually stick human souls inside cans and then market them as if they were people that you could actually talk with, form a, form a friendship with, and then purchase. Um, and so that was a sort of like driving force behind making them like parasocial. And people in our game fought, fell for that hook, line, and sinker. And I'll give you the main example of this. In our game, we had a, we had a cow called Cheese Blueberry Tart. And Cheese Blueberry Tart really likes She's Juicy Melon. She's Juicy Melon is another can. I'll show you She's Juicy Melon now. She's cute. She's kawaii. She's a Harajuku girl. Uh, she's based on Harajuku girl. She's got like, like the sort of pastel colours. Um, and she, on her thing, says that she likes blueberry tart. And everyone's like, oh, that's really cute. We made loads of fan art of them together, holding hands and kissing and stuff. We had so much fan art, I couldn't find any of it. But we had loads of fan art shipping these two characters together. And you'll notice that in real life, a lot of marketers go, okay, we're going we're gonna, to um, pretend these two celebrities are together because it will make the, their brand stronger and people will ship them together. And these things actually really happen because it's like, this is how advertising works. And it's horrible. It's really insidious. And so we turned that on its head in the DLC. And we said, what would happen if you put two, two souls in the same hand? <laughs> so we made 
cheese blueberry melon twist, and we literally say, these two soulful classics, we are being very clear that there are two souls in this can. And if you play this can incorrectly, instead of moaning, they go, help me, this hurts, I don't know what I can do, stop this. And then they are happy when they are released because they are getting out of this can where there are two souls crushed together. And I like, I like to think that that's quite a little funny little play on the whole thing and it really messed a lot of people up because they didn't, when people <laughs> play it, they don't play it wrong normally. So someone had to actually forcefully play it wrong to find this stuff out and it, it made it so much more sinister, like the layers were being pulled back and it was like, oh, okay. And the final one, uh, was the familiar leg legacy in the ARG. So I feel like um, people really responded and resonated to the story of the She's family from like this John She's the first or this Young She's the fourth and their sort of like story and how John She's did everything he could to, re to like resurrect his son. Um, and that led them to um, go and sort of search for the secret clues that we had hidden in the game. So on the She's Only Hands website, um, there were secrets hidden within the HTML code. We had a website called canfiction.net where I'd written some terrible fan fictions in the form of can fictions. Um, and there were sort of there were secrets hidden in that. Uh, we had people coming up with these conspiracy videos. They were called as the Illuminati. Uh, it was it was amazing. <laughs> Um, and, and we just kept hiding these things. There's like secret videos and things all around the internet people have figured out. And they figured out if you type codes into the save game sub files, you get secret messages that you would never be able to hear normally. And eventually we even got a game theory video. <laughs> so if, you've, if you watch game theory, yeah, there's a game theory video. I remember screaming at the top of my lungs when this came out because I didn't expect it. Um, but yeah, um, I think I should have noticed when MatPat joined the Discord server. I was like, oh, oh, maybe there was a clue there, but I, wasn't, I was too busy dealing with sexy cans at the time to worry. <laughs> so what's next? Well, you can't keep a morally repugnant company down. So, <laughs> I'm making a new game. Uh, this game is a horror fishing game, um, and you will be seeing she's coming back, but in a different form, and potentially even a slightly more insidious form than it was in any cans. If you can get even more insidious than putting human souls in cans. Um, and the future is in their hands. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>